I'm going to cut this blade up into several parts. Before I do it, I want to cut it up into sections that are roughly, you know, workable. And um, what I'm doing is I'm, I've got this uh, big old caliper, and actually this stuff is actually picking up some uh, corrosion again, and I've got to go through it and bake all the silica gel in my toolbox. But I've set the edge kind of to where I want it. And I wish you could buy calipers that... Um, that have uh, 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 carbide um, tips in them because I think everybody does this. Not everybody, but most people. Not you know, you know, working in the shop. Not so much in the uh, inspection department. But uh, anyway, so I measured and I made just a little tick mark. And I have a special, I have a special square for doing this. this is an old cheap plastic square. And what I'm doing is I'm just pu I'm putting about at the um, line. I'm taking a marker. And I'm trying to go right on the line, basically. Maybe a little more that way. And uh, this is, you really just want to using this. I don't get my good squares all messed up. And it gives me a guide. And what I do is, oddly enough, I take my original line and just go across it. Because um, the streaks are not so good. And if you had some Dyken Blue, that would work good. Um, I want to get a big Magnum 44 marker, but I still haven't gotten one for, for some reason. And uh, I'm trying to make every streak in this going this way so so um, I could see my line, which is going perpendicular. And once again, I'm going to double check my measurements and make sure I haven't bumped them. I have to be careful because I really can't use the, uh, the fine adjustment on this for this particular marking. And what I'm going to do is make sure I don't go too deep. If I go too deep, this will be on an angle. I think that's a sine, sine or cosine error. And I'm just trying to have this just barely touching the tip. I'm guiding it with my thumb, which is one reason why I can't text very well. And I'm making a little mark. And um, so once I have my mark, I've, I have only a short uh, steel square to work with. And uh, But because this is a, kind of a rough cut, that's not a big deal. But still, I want to try to make all the cuts straight and square. Because uh, maybe I can, it'll give me one more reference edge. To extend this, I'm just putting um, this uh, steel ruler up against this. This is actually an SPI uh, machinist ruler. Unfortunately, this one was not so good, and um, and uh, they gave me a refund on it. And maybe I can true it up at some point, but for straight edge, it's fine. And uh, oops. Anyway, put put putting this up against this. I'm making sure I'm actually on my mark. And I'm scribing my line a couple times. It's trying to do it consistently, like so, so I can see it. With, and once you start sawing, it's harder to see the line anyhow. And uh, I just repeat that for all the uh, marks I need to make. And I, I have I have plans and blueprints for this, but I'm just roughing this out. But this is. This is pretty much how I lay out stuff. I can also take um, this caliper and see how accurate my uh, marks really are by putting this more or less square and checking it in a couple places. I've got the workpiece um, clamped down with this clamp onto the sawhorse so I can push back on it a little bit and have a little bit of friction as far as it connecting to the ground. Um, also, if this were smaller in here and if I cut this off, eventually this would want to roll over this way, maybe. So um, just to make sure this clamp helps. Uh, when I do the other side, I'm going to put a, a clamp on the other, on the other on this side to keep this from falling because this becomes unwieldy. I'm using this porta band saw. Actually, I think it's uh, I don't know if it's a porta band. Anyway, I'm using this rigid saw. I have to be very careful with this because there's no guard on this, and um, if my clothes were to get caught in this, it would be very unfortunate. Anyway, I think I have enough of depth here to make this cut. And uh, so I'm going to give it a shot. If not, I'll finish up with the little uh, power jigsaw. And although I had some pressure on it, when I, especially when I got to the end position myself, so if the saw, even if the blade broke, I wouldn't fall over. So I uh, lost power for my cell phone, so I finished off that cut. I also cut this with the uh, saber saw. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat this cut on this side and uh, I can have, have this kind of clamp so it'll be okay. I can lean on it a little bit. This will want to go like this. This 
this will probably this might stay I don't let's see let's, I have this little board to keep it it'll probably clunk down like this a little bit and hopefully it won't want to rotate around so you always have to figure out what this stuff is going to do because if this falls it cuts your leg pretty good uh, so and once again I have to be really careful with this saw because there is no guard on it and keep my clothes the heck out of the way For now, I'm just making cuts with this uh, battery operated uh, uh, scroll or saber saw. Um, I'm even having better results by using uh, grease um, on the blade rather than oil because it stays and it seems to keep the chips from, from, uh, from bonding to the blade. Um, I wish there was, I wish these blades would have, uh, the teeth were made in such a way that it would eject the, the, the teeth. Um, it's not such a problem with steel, but aluminum is, it kind of galls. And, um, and it makes its way in there. Um, I'm also putting uh, grease on the um, on this little slide here to try to lengthen because I'm I am putting some, you know, some pressure on this, and um, I am I'm using a pick to pull the uh, the um, the kind of bonded um, or galled in um, chips onto the on the blade. And you can feel when it stops cutting. It's usually a, a chip that's bonded in here. Otherwise, it doesn't work bad, and it's been and it seems to be giving me decent accuracy. Um, yeah, I'm also using a little a little chip brush, actually for chips, um, in such a way that I can still see the line. And I'm going to make sure that um, I'm not going to run aground with anything in there. As I as I cut this, I'm going to have to replant it too. And this edge, unfortunately, this edge has to be pretty good. I'm using a diopter uh, kind of uh, glasses so I can so I can get a nice. And also, I have the saw set to one, which uh, at zero it doesn't seem to cut in. Two, it get, becomes unstable. Three, and so forth. I have most of the cut done and I clamped some little boards here underneath to support this and there's a little clamp here to keep this from flipping over under this weight and uh, so I'm still going to take it easy and try to get a feel of what it's going to do. Hopefully it won't do much. Dr. Lewin once said, if you don't know your uncertainty, your measurements are meaningless. <laughs> anyway. Um, you can see I have probably probably about uh, half a millimeter tolerance on this, and uh, th it's fairly square. The um, I don't see much light. You can see the cat walking by, um, and uh, the the cut itself is is kind of rough, but still, what's what's what, what I'm going for rather than surface cosmetic finishes overall accuracy, and I'm fairly happy with, you know of, with this with the tools I have. And uh, once again, I have to be realistic about everything. So, um, so I'm pretty happy with this so far. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sand this down and take down the high spots. This is a butted edge, and it has to be accurate. There are other measurements based off of this too, which makes it, you know, it has to be square and uh, fairly straight. And if there's just, we can take a look at this, and we can see that we have high spots. And if I try to tighten the machine together, it would eventually um, wear down these tie spots and it'll never stay tightened well. So I have a combination disc belt sander here. And if you're ever worried about that, you know, if you hold the end of the plug in your hand, you're pretty sure that uh, no one's going to plug it in or you, you've got the, it, that it's unplugged. It's not a bad habit to do. Anyway, I have a steel square here and I put a piece of electrical tape on it to protect the edge because this is abrasive. This aluminum oxide is well hard enough to ruin the square. And um, if I push it up against the belt, it's fairly square on these boards as far as how I've got this propped up. And I have just an old milk crate and some particle board that seems to be finished. Um, I can't figure out a way to clamp this without get, it getting in the way. So, but if this slides a little bit, I don't think it's going to matter that much as long as it stays level. And I'm going to give this a shot. Okay. 
this is just a raw edge. I'm not worried about that. Um, you can see just a little bit of light at the top coming through. So this plate is tilting up like this while I'm, while I'm sanding it. So I brought the guard up just a bit and I think that will be okay. Putting a square to this edge, if I get it flush, you might be able to see I have just a hair of a gap right here. It's very tiny. So uh, I think that's uh, about a third of a millimeter. I think by the time I straighten out that, this should be a little bit better. Um, in all honesty, I'm okay with this. And uh, you can see that I haven't taken much off of this edge here, but you might be able to see that I've been pretty much sanding this a lot. And uh, so I'm going to spare this edge. And um, But this is pretty good even as it is. I'm going to touch it up a little bit more and see if the angle changes. Just to see, I, uh, I have my little steel square, and this is a this is a 0.25 millimeter uh, feeler gauge. I don't know, it won't fit under there, so I'm pretty happy with this. And the contact is good here, and probably about 75%, 80% here on average. Uh, so I'm happy. Uh, I think I can lay off of, of this, and. Um, Given the nature of these parts, I could take a little more off once I get the finished part. Hopefully, it'll be shorter this way. And um, so, this is only needs to be like 220 millimeters. So, it's after I get this cut, it'd be easier to true up whatever's left over. This is the plate I cut the other day. Um, these two edges are square to this edge. This is a factory edge, and it's a lot better than I can make right now. Um, I should build a milling machine. Anyway, um, so I printed out um, the, uh, a plan for the part I want to make. And uh, unfortunately, this has to be done in two pieces because of my printer. Um, and I, what I did was I laid it up against a, a, a patio door and taped one piece on. Then I taped, lined up and, and taped on the other piece. Um, so I found that I needed to be careful because uh, the first time I did it, the overall length was not right. And so I printed, I printed a, second, a second one and I made sure the overall length is, is right. Um, this edge is not critical. This edge is not critical. This edge is not critical. But what's critical is the, is the width from here to, uh, to the top of the hole. So these, this hole spacing is very critical. It's very critical that this be square. Don't care, don't care, and don't care for these three edges. And, um, so, um, we also have to be careful, like this dimension line, um, I haven't done a lot of uh, research on it, but I don't know if this could be dashed. But you have to be careful uh, about um, your dimension lines. And in this case, I have some ISO lines on this, which uh, maybe I shouldn't include in my print. But um, you have to make sure that you don't cut on reference lines or dimensions. Once again, I'm going to be uh, uh, marking this using the, uh, the optical center punch. So what I decided to do is I'm going to take this, this same exact template and use it in two places. So I've got to be kind of gentle with it. I figure using one template twice would be a lot more accurate than using two separate templates. You've seen me use this optical center punch before. Basically, this is a light guide and it just goes over uh, the mark I want to do. And um, I take a, a punch and just mark it. And I'll repeat that for the rest. Using a knife, I'm just going to make two nicks in this, right in the in the corners of this, like so. It's hard to do this uh, with the camera. So you could see that I've got some extra holes here, but I don't think that'll change much. And um, I'm going to mark these two holes. And then the two holes I'm going to do large. So I, w I was not happy of how long it took to true up the edge using the belt sander. So oddly enough, I wanted to try files, um, and uh, I've done a little pre preliminary, and I'm uh, convinced that it's, it's faster than a belt sander, or at least with the horsepower rating that the one I have has. Anyway, I took my uh, plate here, and this is the edge I want to true up, and I clamped it to a block using a, uh, using this uh, C-clamp here. I'm on a little uh, sawhorse here. And I have an assortment, uh, assortment of files and uh, a file card. And I've got uh, two, two squares so I can check the, the edge for squareness as I go along. Because this is where it gets tricky because um, 
it's all fine to, to make this straight, but if I take it out of the square, it's not going to be good. Um, still, I need some contact here. Right now, it's like roughly 50% contact or something like that. I mean, even from the, you know, it could be generous. Um, the thing is that um, if there's not enough of contact when you tighten up the bolts, these the two, two pieces of metal will gall and gall together, and uh, and it just won't be a, a precision fit or even as it is. Anyway, I don't like listening to this, and uh, so I wear ear protection, and uh, I also definitely wear gloves. I don't like working with files without using gloves. Um, also, I play guitar, and my hands are, as you probably saw, are are uh, pretty messed up from working with tools um, and working hard with them. Looking at this top edge here, if I take a straight edge and put it across, I can, uh, A, you can feel rocking as there's rocking, and B, I can see where it's, uh, where it's touching and not touching by looking and seeing where there's light through here. Like, it's a little tight still here, along here, so I'll make a mark on that. And, uh, where else is it, is it high? It's mostly high in this edge, but it's got to be high somewhere else, too. Right in here. So it's like human nature to try to mess this up. So because this process isn't that fast, you can kind of wander and kind of lose your way, as it were, and go off. And um, so you have to check everything now and then. It's also, uh, uh, it's also tight probably through here. And there's a reason why I'm putting these on the top. The first thing I want to look at is my magic marker lines. It's the first thing I want to tap. And uh, so... So this is a just how long of kind of a reference. This will dig in, just make a notch. This will make everything flat, but um, to a point. But we have a proclivity to try to mess it up. So also you have to be careful that we have to kind of watch this angle too because we don't want to we don't want to uh, we don't want to be put a bevel on this. In the end, it's I, I think it's in our nature to try to round this like this. And I, when I'm when just about there, I'm going to use the, um, the the belt sander just to, to flatten it up the last little. Bit. These cut fast because there's there's a very small area of contact. That this the file card helps too. Excuse the leaf blower. I usually try to wait for where they're at, but I gotta get stuff done. In Silicon Valley, there's always a, a leaf blower going. I try putting oil in here. Let's see how this works. It's the teeth digging into the metal that makes it cut, not the friction. So let's see. This might save me a little bit of work. And besides, the, uh, the oil is good for the uh, file. I marked my two spots again, and uh, they're changing a little bit, so I must be removing the material. The problem with the oil is it it, it, it does uh, make this, the uh, chips uh, kind of hang in the fire. Sorry once again about the noise. Once again, like uh, almost like scraping, uh, you can kind of feel hinge points. At least I found one before. Yeah, there's a there's a hinge point right here. Something like that. Because I I feel that uh, it's my my proclivity to round this edge. What I did is I took a file and I, I clamped a block of uh, metal onto it and it'd be better if it was round. And the idea is that I could take this and keep this against the metal. So in other words, so I don't round it as much. So in other words, if this thing is square, so this thing can't roll basically as long as I'm holding it and if I drag it like this it should remain pretty straight and take down just the top area uh, hypothetically I can test that by making some lines going across and while I'm at it I can see about how well I'm doing on the whole thing so I'm, I'm, I know that the top will come off first unfortunately this is kind of handed as it goes on a particular side And what I'm doing is just holding this to the edge. Like this. It's kind of like a plane. Until I get this plate cut, I think this is good enough for now. I'm pretty happy with how square it is. And, uh...
This is a uh, point point uh, uh, point ten uh, millimeter feeler gauge, and it doesn't go underneath it. So that, that's fine for now. I'm setting up this cut like like the others, but it's a little more complicated. So I set up the tooth about here, and you can see uh, I have the uh, battery out. Um, what makes it complicated? This is very much an angle, so. You know, usually you just measure along the edge, and so you get used to the edge being one of your references. But, um, so if I'm putting the tooth right here, then if I put a square here and uh, measure, which is hard to do upside down for some reason, if I measure, I'm about 100 millimeters here, along he from, from here to here, and I'm measuring square. And so now, as I go down, and um, I'm probably out of view, but as I go down, um, this line has to be 100 millimeters, say, say here, but as far on the end as I can. And I got this thing fairly well clamped. There's actually a gap under here because it's actually bending and, and twisting. So I have to be careful that um, if I get saw a vibration, it's going to want to let go. And I, Once again, you shouldn't do this at home. I've been using tools for a long time, and I accept the risk that, uh, you know, a piece of carbide could fly off of here. A piece of metal could just fly. I'm wearing safety protection, air, air plugs, and uh, hearing protection because this is loud. I'm also making sure that the base of the saw doesn't uh, flip on this little uh, clamp here. To watch that it's pretty close and uh, as I can only I can't cut all the way I've got to clamp both sides to make sure this plate which is heavy doesn't fall so uh, also uh, I've I made sure that I've got a clear path underneath this and uh, if I cut a little plywood at the edge I'm not worried about that or a little plastic I'm once again I found these saw horses on the side of the road once again you shouldn't try this at home and uh, I'm wearing gloves, but I have to accept that I need to keep my gloves out of the way. I might guide the, uh, the front of this, but I kind of set it up so if I slip, I slip away from the saw. And, uh, and uh, fortunately, there's a, there's a pretty good guard in front of this. Maybe you could even put a little more here, but uh, also the saw guard sometimes becomes a problem. Also, I only have the blade about as deep as it needs to go. And uh, I'm about ready to start. The cut came out okay. I actually went back and resawed it a little bit. Oddly enough, the uh, the cut is better than my line, I think. And uh, this doesn't rock much, but the uh, I'm seeing a little line. I think that when I traced this, I might have taken the scribe and moved it a little like that. I have to be more careful of that, but uh, overall, I'm happy with the cut. I need to cut out this uh, this little thing here, and I wanted a radius in the corner. And I was hoping to use, uh, out of desperation, a, a Fossner bit, a woodcutting Fossner bit, in order to um, to cut the, to to put in the radius in the corners. Um, unfortunately, this drill press does not have enough torque to push this um, bit through metal, and basically it can buff the metal, but it has a hard time removing chips. The chips it removes are very thin, but uh, if it could just and basically, I could, when I stall it out, I'll remove chips. If I don't stall it out, then um, it's not removing material. And uh, I get tired of working with some of this stuff. It's it's physically demanding for me. Um, this is this is like oh, this is down to like six pounds, uh, maybe seven pounds, which is nice compared to a lot of the other stuff I was picking up. And uh, my back's not so good, so uh, I spent a lot of time recovering and. Um, I've got gloves and I've got and I have sleeves to be very careful with especially I have to be careful when I'm turning on the drill press um, and to keep the keep out of harm's way that's the important thing have you and uh, I tend to use my my uh, part of my elbow to, to uh, move this around fortunately this is a weak drill press if this were a very strong drill press I wouldn't be so blase about drilling holes like this or about um, without um, clamps and stuff. But this drill press will, will likely stop or snap off the bit before, uh, in this case, uh, if something went wrong. And uh, 
Try to keep track of the little number. I don't really have any kind of cooling system, so I just use a little oil and stuff. Um, oddly enough, I think if it some kind of coolant, it would work better, be more ecological, ecologically sound too. Last night I was busy cleaning up all my tools, making sure there's no uh, corrosion on them, and I put some a light coat of uh, machine oil, in this case sewing machine oil on them, and uh, I used to use uh, uh, mineral oil because it's, I think it's the least toxic of all the oils, I don't have any on hand. Anyway, I, I'm taking a steel square and I'm just drawing a, scribing a line here to uh, finish these out, and uh, Although the Fussner was a total failure, between all the bits I was able to remove most of the material and the rest I could just file. It's only one quadrant. Fortunately, this is not a critical uh, dimension here. And uh, so. And the reason why you round the corners is just so cracks don't form here. There's going to be a lot of pressure in this. I don't think it'll actually crack um, given the. Um, you know the the condition of this. Although this is a pretty hard plate, but it's supposed to be stress relief. What we'll push you see. So I've got a file from here, basically to here. You know this, this quadrant here, and uh, our arms are heavy, so it actually helps a little bit to have the part that you're filing pointing down if you can. So, uh... Oddly enough, this uh, file. It actually helps, it actually ejects the, uh, the, uh, um, the shavings if you pull it a little bit, which is really strange. Usually it clogs it up more and ruins your file. If this were steel, I would definitely not do that because it's hard enough to push the teeth down. You saw the trouble I was having um, cutting in this. Um, I went to the I went to the hardware store and I bought um, these are these are Bosch, but you don't have to necessarily buy uh, Bosch. But these are have a shank that fits my uh, my uh, saber saw. But um, these are I think these are uh, twelve teeth per inch, and that's really good for this. And these have been cutting a lot better, and uh, probably four times as much. And these aren't getting clogged up like the other ones. I still don't like using battery operated tools uh, beyond their capacity and um, I don't know if this saw was designed to do this if, but uh, I don't expect the batteries to last forever but I can't afford to buy another saw this uh, quality so I'm just going to use this for now. I have this clamp just to a block, and um, so this is a this is a rat tail file. It's very very coarse. It cuts through the metal very quickly. Um, if I just file like this, I could never keep a line. But if I file on an angle like this, and then reverse it like this, and then largely it give me the benefit of being able to remove a lot of metal in a quick amount of time and kind of keep it straight. Let's see. And I'm mostly pushing on it, so it's like put heave drag, heave drag. And so that's kind of the motion you want. And the more I change my angle to straighten out like that, the uh, the more the, the greater the chance I have of uh, you know of, of it not being straight. But I gotta blend this little radius a little bit. And uh, so finally this isn't that bad. And this is, a, like I said, a very non-critical uh, measurement. And, um, so this is mostly for aesthetics, as long as there's no real big uh, stress uh, concentrators. You know, oh, there's a notch in this, and like, you know, could, depending on what you're making, could be a problem. And. Uh, this the whole machine is just a prototype, so until I make sure it works, how much time do I want to spend on a spell? I think it will work. And then once you get it uh, roughed out, you could uh, use a flat file. But the flat file will put notches in the edges. 
to part once again because our arms are heavy and uh, you might as well use that weight. It's, it doesn't make any sense to push up and hold your arms up and push up when you could um, basically just let your arms, the weight of your arms do the work for you. This is why vices are so popular. So I didn't even bother drawing um, radii on these, um, and I'm just going to use a little a little cap for making the radii. The thing is, I I can get a nice radii like this, but if I printed out a paper template and try to do that, it would be even harder. And so I use the cardboard back backing, and I try not to sweat the uh, the things that don't matter too much. This just has to be rounded so I don't hurt myself on it, and um, and it'll make it a little aesthetically pleasing. Uh, Once again, I'm using a round file. I should really have a handle on this, but uh, I don't know if the handle is going around. Probably this seems to be, it's, this is not as easy as, as sanding it, but you know what? It goes quicker. I'm going to use these 6 by 30 millimeter cap bolts to hold the machine together. I don't want um, too much, uh, you know, depth because I won't be able to tap it without breaking it and um, we're bottoming it out and um, I do need some little room for washer so that's about right. I'm going to try a smaller drill bit on these because I'm going to I'm going to piece this together. I'm going to use a centering punch on all these locations to put it in the adjoining part so this machine will not have interchangeable parts. A little bit of a little bit of oil helps the um, chips not to stick. <laughs> To give all the holes a light countersinking. Once again, I tend to give it a brief but um, somewhat firm, like that. Maybe not quite that much. I sprayed a little um, quick drying uh, lacquer spray paint on this uh, rather than magic marker around the, all the edges, but uh, unfortunately, it doesn't stand really well. Anyway, um, so these are the templates for these parts, and I, once again, I, I took in the uh, I measured the overall length to make sure they're okay and also I doctored up any square edges I can with the steel squares. And you can see I don't have a lot of extra space for this. Uh, I got the rest of the parts cut out and um, I had, you had seen how I did these plates and as opposed to the others I figured I would just uh, continue cutting them out. Um, there's a couple extra holes in here like this is extra and that's I don't think that's going to make any appreciable difference at all. This is a little a little upsetting, but a lot of times when stuff bends, the, the stresses end up being on the outside. That's why I beams work. Um, this is a little upsetting because this is kind of not in a great place because as this bends and stuff, it want to tear here and compress here. And while this, if you pull it this way, to compress here and want to tear here, and um, a lot of times stresses stresses like if you. If you clip this corner too much, then you're still uh, you're clipping away parts where the stress would be. So um, I've done some finite element analysis on certain things, that, well enough to 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 try to you know keep track of stuff. So anyway, I got some preliminary uh, work done in this. On, on this, maybe I want to touch these up a little bit on the bottom, but um, as you can see, the sides they're they're kind of rough. You know, they still have scars in them, but there's no functional difference. And for right now, because this is an experimental machine, I don't know how far I'm going to go. So my thought is um, to do the next work on these. These parts have a, a milled edge here, and the only thing I have to do is trip the corner and make sure it doesn't get in the way. If these are a different story. I've got to make this entire surface flat and make this corner square. When I was talking about non-critical stuff, this is not what I was talking about. This this is, this is fairly critical. This has to be square. This holds the machine into being square. So the first thing I'm going to do is probably round the corners and get the, the little work to do on the edges just to get it at least to this level. I do this, these things in kind of phases. So I tend to try to get most of the heavy work done first and then work towards the fine work. And uh, this is the mount for the ball screw, these two plates. You can see how rough they are. Uh, I, I took a little time and I sanded the bottom on this. And so it goes like this and then the ball screw, would, I would cut a hole through this and the ball screw. But that's, um, that's after this stuff. This is the stuff I'm worried about. So, uh, and the stuff that's stressing me out. And so I'm gonna look on this next. 
So I'm going to do some belt sender work. This belt sender is kind of wimpy. So uh, actually, I have to be careful with it. And I've got some uh, some marks scribed for the corners. And most of this is just cosmetic, but some of it to keep from getting hurt by it, you know. And uh, I'm not going to fuss with the cosmetic stuff yet because I have so much other work to do. But I want to hit this a little bit. And uh, I have to be careful. I'm going to wear gloves so I don't cut up my hands like I have once already so doing this. And... Uh, so I gotta keep the gloves out of here. Remember the guards can open up if you wedge it in like this. It can open up and pull your hands in. And uh, uh, also, I've, it's, it's pretty chilly, so I'm wearing long sleeves. Have to be careful when I'm working with this. I have to remember to, that this can draw me in too. And uh, so be careful of your tool. I have the smaller, one of the smaller brackets mounted in a vise. I figured I'd do the easy ones first and you know gain a little, refresh a little skill on doing them. And uh, so they have a little rate just to have a little radius in the corner and um, it's not you know it's not totally smooth. I was originally going to drill a hole in the corner of these just to, but uh, I didn't want to take that much uh, material out. Um, so I've got a steel square and I'm just fitting it in the corner like that. And I've got a couple files and I'm just trying to you know straighten it out and uh, doing a little doing a little draw filing and a little regular filing to uh, to uh, see where I am and I'm trying not I'm trying to be kind to this surface I'm trying to keep it flat I actually try try to get the the file balanced be just just so just so you know just to try to keep this surface flat and so forth and this is a process I mean these are the easier ones you can see if I put the square here you can see light coming through there and so uh, wherever it's tight then I just have to remove before before I even worry about how level this is, I want to take off the high spots. The really high spots. And uh, I have this uh, kind of art store straight edge and you can see a lot of light under here. So I have a lot of work to do. So I'm gonna I'm gonna knock off the highest spots and then I'm gonna start measuring it from to see how uh, parallel it is. So far I find that uh, this half round file, actually this radius file, it's not quite half. Um, it seems to be some of the, one of the fastest cutting things I have uh, that I'm using. And when I'm doing this, I if I just did this, it would be good for taking out local spots. But if you do it like this, then you still have only a couple teeth cutting into the metal, so they're going to cut fast. And uh, so, uh, Because this is kind of far off, I took a caliper and basically did a dimensionless... Uh, assessment on this and finding the smallest part and then I scribe the line and I'm going to stand out a little bit before I even try to file it more. The camera's kind of in the way, but... And if you change files and change filing techniques, you start to see the high spots. I have a little oil on here and make it easier. I don't think the friction helps the filing process. This was milled by the factory originally when this plate was made into whatever it was meant to be and um, I took and made this, this edge parallel to this uh, surface and uh, so I, in, in the hopes that I would try to make it straight and um, so what I have here is better than, um, better than a tenth of a millimeter so that's a good place to start I think and um, now what I've got to do is I've got to take a square and get in here and, and make this square here. First I'm gonna take a uh, fairly coarse file and try to get an average over this and knock the tops off to see where I'm at. After only 10 minutes of work, you can see it's not too bad. It's tight here and it's tight here. So uh, now I actually wanna put a little pressure on this to, uh, so I'm gonna take care of these two areas. So I'm fairly happy with this. There's a couple little scars in it, but I'm not worried about that. Um, what I'm going for is just general uh, surface contact. And uh, so I put my square in here. I am pretty, pretty good. I've got a little, just a little bit of tightness down here on this. And I'm going to take that out with uh, this little tiny file and do it in a very local way. And you have to be careful doing this because you can make problems. I have the uh, first vertical plate in place, 
right now is just clamp with three clamps and I'm using a piece of plywood in between here to keep maintain the 10 millimeter gap that's supposed to be there about um, I'm not too awfully worried about keeping this square because um, as I put these plates on these plates will take over making it square and uh, this one's much longer you can see, kind of get the gist of how this is going to be put together and uh, maybe I should have made these a little bit thicker but I I would it might have ran out of material anyway it's clamped in place I'm not laboring under any kind of misconception that this machine will have interchangeable parts so I have a ball peen hammer and once again this is a, um, a centering punch and um, so it's just got a little dimple on the end of a, a, a little piece of uh, you know steel you know uh, turned um, rod and I'm going to go underneath here find my holes and I, at each time I do this, I'm going to make sure I don't move it appreciably. So I've got to drill four holes into the bottom of this plate and, uh, and the other plate like it. And uh, obviously it won't fit underneath the drill press. And I was trying to position this piece here to clamp it so I can drill it. And I couldn't do it. So what I decided to do is just clamp a piece of metal onto this and make sure that's... Uh, you know fairly square and basically I have this thing um, you yeah, know basically uh, clamped against the side of this cabinet and uh, you know this is not optimal but at the same time I think it'll work and um, you know you gotta use what you have some time you know and uh, let's give this a shot <laughs> Oddly, for these eight bolts, this seems to be working, and uh, and they're fairly straight, I think, and uh, probably within a degree or two, so uh, I'm going to keep on doing this until it's done, and uh, this is not exactly a safe operation. As a matter of fact, I tried clamping this, and it's really convenient. I have to push pressure on this, so I don't recommend you try this at home, but you know what? Oh, it's drilling. I have a cordless drill in the countersink. I'm going to get the holes a moderate amount of uh, countersinking so it starts nice and straight maybe a little more in this one like so when I tap I don't like to turn with my hand I want to turn with my with my with my turn my arm like this I uh, the best thing I think I could do with my hand is keep things straight and uh, so it's almost like doing vibrato on a guitar except for it's tapping and uh, that way your your hands you know don't get that tired so that's eight holes and sometimes I, I pull this down but when you do it like this you have to support the tap when you spin it out like this you have to support it you don't want to break it not doing something like this you can see it's nice and dirty you have to be careful too if you use your best artist squint, uh, you might be able to see the, the, what I'm working on. Um, anyway, so I got these plates just temporarily bolted on. They're, they're only snug. They're not really that all that tight yet. And, um, and um, so far, I'm happy. Oddly enough, they give a little lateral strength, which is surprising because I didn't count on them doing that. And so I came up with these plates here, which will bolt into both, both this side plate and this plate here. And there's one big one and there's one little one and these are fairly square and these should these should really make this fairly solid and uh, unfortunately um, there's no way in, in Hades I can get a centering punch down besides the rail to mark these and I also found out that uh, my bolts can't quite make it and um, I'm, I'm, I don't want to notch the rail just so I can put in bolts and take them out so I'm gonna I'm going to take this plate out and continue like this and pretty much the front end of the machine will have to be lift, lifted up to sneak this in and out. I'm okay with that. Uh, you know, it's all about choices. I just don't want to notch these rails. They're nice. And why make it any weaker, you know, because of laziness. Anyway, so I'm happy. Uh, this is this. I can even move the cart by this thing, which I didn't count on. This is what I call the front of the machine. It just has the radio only bearing. This is the ball screw. This is the ball screw mount. 
Uh, the gantry plate is uh, still mounted for the moment. I'm starting to call this the plate of unoffingness because I have to, seems like I have to keep on taking it on and off to do the next operation. So I have to couple the ball nut to the gantry. In order to do that, I came up with this little plate situation, which is three plates. And um, these plates just triangulate this plate. And, um, and like when it moves one way, this wants to lay down, and then this is under tension. And when it wants to move the other way, this is under tension. And uh, the compression is not so good. I mean, it helps a little bit, but you really need some thickness, you know, some, some something to keep it from going zigzags, because this wants to bow in or out or form a little zigzag if it's under compression. So it's better to, to do stuff under tension. I mean, like if you look at the old um, World War I uh, biplanes, all there were wires holding the whole thing together instead of I-beams, because it's lighter. Anyway. Um, so this is going to be kind of tricky to assemble, so I've got to finish this plate. It's got to be here more narrow, and then um, I'm going to bolt this together in a flat surface, and then position it on the plan, and then I'm going to position everything where it's supposed to be, tape the plan down, take all the junk off, and then um, once the plan is ta firmly taped down, I can unbolt the plate of unoffingness, actually the lower the gantry plate, and drill that as well as, I, as I'm doing the other stuff I need to do on it. And uh, the first thing I need to do is uh, cut this out and file a little bit so it can accommodate the ball nut. To make these two cutouts, I'm using the uh, better effort in scroll saw, which I've, seems to be a pretty tough tool because I haven't killed it yet. And um, no, I'm not being compensated from DeWalt, at least not yet, anyhow, maybe they should. By the way, you can tighten up uh, file handles just by dropping them on the handle like that. Uh, this uh, double cut file seems to work really good for the aluminum. I've used this file more than any other for this whole project. And yes, I'm using the uh, rounded edge first. And the reason why is I can get more pressure so the teeth actually cut. And when I'm filing, uh, I don't have to be so pedantic, but when I'm filing, I'm he kind of heaving into the metal and drag, heave, drag, heave to hardly any pressure. And uh, that way the, the teeth don't clog up. And uh, it looks like I'm doing it both ways. The file only cuts one way. So if you, uh, if you push down while you're dragging, then you're just wasting energy. This is interesting because it's hard not to hit the sides when I'm trying to wipe out the center. The file might want to go where I want it to, but it might not. See, it just went which way I want. Anyway, that should work. It doesn't have to be perfect. I finished cutting this uh, uh, little U-shaped slot. I've got the block that mounts the uh, ball, ball nut uh, just clamped between some scraps of metal and so I can drill it. And uh, I guess I'm going to have to swing this away to, to drill the other side, I think. Let's see. I don't want to break the This is the drill bit size for the tap. I've got this little block assembly uh, put together and um, the holes are tapped out. I put it on a flat plate and tightened it up and I'm trying to get a good relationship between this and this plate. And uh, what I'm really looking for is the location of the holes that are on this template. And uh, also I checked a number of things and made sure that the template was square. Um, and uh, it was very really critical to make sure that I've got an even gap on either side of this. I'm tempted to uh, punch this thing while it's right on here, but unfortunately that'll probably I could damage the bearings. I don't want that. That's the kind of, uh, kind of stress that the machine wouldn't normally see. So I think I'm pretty happy with it, and uh, I'm going to slide this out. And I've got my template here, and uh, so this is how this came out. It's fairly fairly sturdy. It didn't need to be this heavy. But this could have been thinner. 
and uh, it's somewhat rigid. I'm using shorter bolts. The holes themselves encroached in, inside one another. Maybe you can see there, but the bolts won't let you short. I have all 14 holes drilled and tapped on the uh, ball screw mount, and um, this is how the filing came out. Taking down the gantry plate, uh, or the plate of unoffingness, and um, as I call it, and um, I'm marking the locations for these braces. They give it lateral strength, and uh, there's one large one and one small one that go on each side. And uh, I took a marker and I darkened up a line, and um, then I took a scribe and scribed a line down the center. And then I sighted down these holes and looking look for the line to bisect the uh, hole. And then I'm taking the uh, centering punch and a hammer and I'm marking the locations. I can't hit it too hard because it's just clamped up. And I, I foresee problems drilling these holes, but I'll figure out some way to do it. I knew I would have problems with these holes. Uh, I was able to do these here and because I could get this under and this didn't hit the top of the drill press, but this one I definitely can't get. And uh, so I'm just going to use a hand drill and try to keep it straight. And uh, when I do stuff like this, I try to make sure that what, whatever the part I'm kind of holding down is straight so, you know, you don't want to psych yourself out and, uh, or I don't want to psych myself out. And when I drew these up originally, I thought these holes would be very problematic, but as it turns out, because the tap handle does this, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. Good. Whoever figured out that this thing should slide, good for them. Good for me, too. I got uh, one side done as far as these uh, supports, and, and they, uh... <laughs> I don't know. I can't move it. So, I'm happy with that. This whole thing vibrates on both sides, so... Uh, plus, um... The, um, the axis is going to be bolted here, and it's going to connect these two rails, and so uh, yeah, so the lateral strength will be multiplied by two. And uh, you just have to worry a little bit about twist, but most of the twist will happen, you know, between here and here. Um, this basically is just going to operate in kind of a planar way. It's just going to pull basically on the edge of this. If you could think, it won't we'll pull on the edge, but. Basically, this thing is just going to pull kind of on this plane, you know, and um, almost kind of a sheer kind of way. And uh, most of the twist will happen between the rails and this. Some will be transmitted through here because there is a little play in the bearing somewhere. And um, so I'm very happy with this. Drilling out the holes for the ball nut mount. And uh, unfortunately, the center two, I can't reach on my drill press. This is only about four and a half inches and I still can't reach the end of it with my drill press and uh, so I'm just going to use a hand drill and try to be accurate and hope for the best and I don't like hope is a plan but that's how it goes sometimes. This is the pilot hole. Once again when I countersink I use a lot of pressure over a short duration. That way it doesn't chatter. My friend loaned me this uh, uh, belt sander, and apparently it's got some auto belt thing that almost works, but um, this thing cuts like the dickens, but it's uh, not so easy holding it back. It's very enthusiastic, which reminds me of those belt sander races, but let's see how it looks. I'm in the process of marking these plates, these side plates for the other axis. I call it the x-axis. I always think of x and y looking down from the top and z giving it depth, but that's just me. Um, that's also replicated basically on 3D printers. Uh, notwithstanding, so um, I wanted to make sure that I got this pretty close, at least so it can be fudge factored in and... Um, so I measured from the bottom of the plates to the top to make sure both of these plates were about the same. And then um, then I felt okay enough to uh, measure from the top down and just tape this. Because it's good to have to be able to feel what you're doing. Um, and uh, often when I'm measuring, so when I'm lining stuff up, I use my, my uh, fingernail instead of the fleshy part of my hand. Because you can compress this and your, and your, your fingernail is more accurate. Anyway... I uh, I taped this on and best I could because it's like 37 degrees in the garage today, and uh, oddly in Silicon Valley and um, and I marked these locations using the optical center punch, which is not easy given it's a small surface, but it seemed to come out okay, and so this will be drilled and tapped like a lot like the others. So because this this plate also won't fit underneath my drill press. Um, 
like I have a clamp to this block with two clamps and uh, the only thing really holding it is friction so I put two clamps on there and uh, I try to get these holes straight I measured from this corner down and from and, and versus this edge and I want this hold these holes to be pretty straight as best I can this is not a precision surface on top of this and um, but it's still better than I could do by hand um, I don't want to drill a crooked hole. I don't want it to slip. I don't want to break a bit. And I don't want, definitely don't want, want to break off the tap. And when it's all assembled, I also don't want to bend a, bend a bolt while I'm trying to clamp this down. So the drilling is largely uh, the same as the other, except for it's off the edge. You have to be careful because the drill press will want to tip while you're doing it. You'll have only, only the weight of the drill press, which is not all that great. So you need a lot of patience to do this. And I'm watching as the, as the drill press wants to tilt, it's also uh, bending the drill a bit. So I'm backing off on it and just going really easy. So I'm happy how the machine's going together. And um, anyway, um, so I have the frame together and I have the gantry together. Right now the gantry is attached. The frame was bolt all bolted together. Um, so I used this um, gantry plate that you can that's right here that goes across to make the two rails parallel and then I adjusted it in but um, that doesn't mean it's square what I'd like to do is um, get the machine square as well um, doing a rough estimate from basically the corners of these rails I think that it's within two millimeters um, diagonally and um, I want to see if I can get it as good as I can get it. I, I, I really want it within one millimeter. And doing it off the corner of these rails is probably not the best way to do it. But uh, um, taking it off the corner of the linear guide rail would be a better measurement. And to measure the corner of the rail, I'm going to take my measuring tape. And there's a little hook here. It's really made to go over a nail originally. I think Stanley Works actually invented this kind of hook thing. And um, I'm putting a magnet in on it, a neodymium magnet from an old hard drive. And uh, it's still loose enough so I can pull it tight. And that's how I do one end. To measure the other corner, I've got it once again held up with another neodymium magnet I got from a hard drive. And the problem is you could swing this either way and the, uh, the, uh, the little uh, tick marks on the measuring tape are on one edge. And so I need to know what's going on across the whole thing. So I'm going to take a little square and push it up it's here and go here. I've got 191.6. So this thing is square width and one millimeter as best I can tell. So I didn't know that much about these uh, linear bearing blocks and I still don't but I downloaded the technical manual for them and uh, they claimed that they did have a keeper for the bearings. So I was cautiously optimistic. Um, I uh, had one screw that was proud on in the rail. I screwed it in so I could slide each one off, keeping them in order and making sure not to turn them right from left. I'm also sure not to swap these from rail to rail because these might be sized to an original rail. And uh, I don't know how well you can see it here, but uh, there's some there's some dust here and uh, on these on this wiper. So I want to get that off. And um, as I did on this one, there's some dirt in here too. Um, as I did on this one, I want to put I put some uh, uh, polyurea grease in here and kind of worked it in here. I don't have a grease gun. I think I'm going to have to get one. I don't know if there's any evidence that these things were really greased since uh, I was trying to determine whether or not this machine is square enough to say this is close enough that I can ingest it from here. Okay, and each one of these um, uh, connections between this plate and this rail. I've got a hole, and I'm going to exaggerate it a little bit, and um, so I've got two holes, and they might be dead on, or they might be a little off, and when I and then I'm going to put a bolt inside inside of this. Let's just say this is the bolt to we'll make this a little bit extra small. So here's my bolt. Here's like this is the top plate hole. This is the bottom plate hole. Well, you can see that I've got a little adjustment here, but I don't have any adjustment here. And what I want in the end is to have to have to have like say a millimeter or two millimeters of adjustment all the way around the bolt, even if it means that 
even if it means that this is elongated like this. So for each corner, I'm going to reduce the bolt count down the two, mark the two bolts that are uh, that are, that are remain, and then if you sight them here, oddly enough, this is hard hard to discern unless I move the camera back and forth, which would not be fun for you, but. Uh, this one's almost straight through. This one's got a little ledge on the uh, as it goes through the lower rail. So I'm going to run a drill through each one of these, and then I'm going to uh, put replace the rest of the bolts, and then take out the two marked bolts, and then those do those as well on each corner. And what this will do once again is give me a little adjustment once it's close, because um, you know it's like. It's good now, but I want to be able to move it around a little bit more to get that last little bit in if I want to. Like so. To get this bolt uh, deep inside the rail, I just took my wrench and I taped uh, a, a nut, a lock washer, and a washer on it. And uh, so that it doesn't require too much skill. I'm just kind of thread it on there like that. So I'm not happy with the clearance on these um, holes as far as... Um, the um, linear rail bearings uh, go and um, so I'm going to try drilling through I'm only going to try going up one size uh, larger for now and to protect the rail when I go through I'm um, putting a block between that and the rail I don't want to scar the rail at any cost and uh, I'm going to try just free drilling it from the bottom because basically when you drill a hole basically follows the other hole so let's see how this works it's a lot of work to take this thing off. Unfortunately, this is, gonna be, this is not a good way to hold the drill because not only do the chips go, it's also hard to manage to torque. And that's why I have the block. I got the uh, ball screw mount suggested as much as I could for right now because um, um, you know, it's still up on blocks, so I can only move the gantry so close to the ends, and really I want to move it right to the ends to adjust it, and um, so, so if there's a problem, it'll be more apparent, and you can get it closer. Uh, anyway, so um, uh, how I did this was, I moved, ended up moving the gantry all, to way, all the way to one end, and, um, and the end I chose is the one that's least adjustable, which is that end. It's not as adjustable as this end. And um, this thing is more firmly attached to, and uh, because it has the um, uh, the thrust bearings, more or less. And um, so I I got that kind of relationship with that straightened out with um, the um, the ball nut. And then um, and while I was doing that, actually, um, I got this plate planer with it, you know, this way with the ball nut. So it's not, um, you know, it's not yawing off, and um, so I put these kind of, kind of not not too snug, but just a friction fit, and then I bolted the um, this this plate down and tightened up that, and then I brought it over here and I was able to tighten up the rest of it and um, tighten up this end here, and once again it's it's not perfect yet and. Um, and I put some oil on here for the first time in uh, probably, you know, 10 or 20 years. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the ball screw seems to work. And um, um, I don't have any load on it, so I can't say how much, uh, how much plate there's going to be. But uh, maybe, there, maybe there won't be much. And I still got to work some more oil into this, um, into these bearings and stuff. And um, I only have so much grease in the bearings on the linear way, so... I have to keep that in mind too, but so far it's coming out okay. So I wanted something adjustable with vibration isolation, and this is uh, all thread, and this is half inch. I really wish I had uh, at least five eighths or three quarters, but they didn't seem to have it at my local building hardware supply store. So what I have here is one, two, three, four nuts, and I've got one, two, three, four, five medium washers one lock washer and two large washers and um, so what I hope to do is put this will be the, this will support the mill and this will go on my rail like this and so I have a little little bit of just a little bit of vibration isolation and uh, really you'd want something on top and um, so let's see how this works um, I need to cut this threaded rod into four sections, and uh, I'm going to try this uh, uh, battery-operated sawzall kind of thing, and um, 
Uh, I don't like using slow because there's a vibration involved, and it actually makes my ears ring, and it's probably not good for uh, probably not good for me. But um, as a musician, but um, so I'm gonna give this a shot. I don't know if this spice will stay still, but we're gonna give it a shot. Did I mention I hate using sawzall kind of tools? I just jumped the tooth, but. I have four rods um, cut and um, now I'm going to dipper them with a belt sander. I'm going to use hockey pucks as isolators. These are cheap uh, hockey pucks. They I actually had to put them outside for a while because they stunk so bad. I have no idea what's in them as far as rubber composition, but it's n probably not good. Anyway, they're somewhat squishy and um, I'm using a center finder. And these are also, this was kind of a fancy one, but um, you can find these on a lot of uh, little, those little tri squares with the extra attachments or combination squares. And uh, so uh, I'm finding the center of these and it's not so accurate because they're it's kind of not a great datum surface for the edge of these, but... <laughs> Oddly, just drilling four holes through these things stunk up this whole area in the garage. What am I gonna, what's gonna happen when I drill the big hole in them? Anyway, let's give this a shot. This isn't gonna be that accurate, but that's okay. And if it wants to come out of my hands, I'm just gonna move my hands. To widen up the holes, I'm just using this uh, step drill, and uh, this is really crappy metal, but it should be strong enough for this. I tried leaning on this even with one piece, and it seems strong enough, but I'm definitely going to double it up and be careful with it until then. And uh, and I'm going to have to drill these holes in the support piece as well, so uh, in a way I'm making more work for myself, but I want to move on and progress. <laughs> Well, I'm working kind of underneath the garage door eave um, because the cat took out my work light that I used for this part of the garage. Anyway, this is the other ho the other horizontal axis. Um, I call this the x-axis. Other people might, and um, I look at like like um, you know CNC machines as having x and y, and then the z being the depth. But that's just me. Um, anyway. Um, so I kind of designed this machine around some features which you can't see underneath this access. But um, there's two holes underneath this piece of paper, one here and one here. And I kind of found the center of this and double checked measuring uh, to make sure it was you know, within a half a millimeter um, with the measuring tape. And um, I had printed out some more templates, cut them out and center punched them. And uh, so I have uh, six locations for each side, as you can see. Um, this one, I also scribed a horizontal line here using a steel square, because while I can probably use this slot, I might want to widen it. And if I widen it, I want to know where the center originally was, why I still can. And to establish these lines, I used the um, kind of milled um, edge here. And um, I used a steel square, and my steel square is not long enough, so I took a, a steel measuring tape or a stainless steel measuring tape and butted it up against it. And then I was able to get a line long enough. I need a larger steel square. And um, anyway, this should be accurate enough because I intend to bore these holes, you know, pretty pretty large. And, um, well, relatively, I think uh, I'm putting a 6mm screw in, I'll probably take them up to like 8 or maybe even 9 millimeters. And... Um, yeah, so these have to safely pass features underneath the, uh, this, um, axis. And this is going to be a bear to drill because, um, how am I going to drill it? <laughs> like, if I don't want to drill it with a hand drill because it's 20, 20 millimeters thick. And if I drill it on the floor, I'm sure to hurt my back because I hurt my back like that before. Just, just kind of crouching over stuff. So, um. Although this is roughly 60 pounds, so it's kind of hard for me to move around. And I will likely hurt myself in the short term, but um, I just don't want to hurt myself in the long term. Uh, I do have back problems. So I have the access uh, upside down and propped up on blocks. I used a block in order to slide it along this uh, Formica top table. And uh, 
I'm sorry about the lighting in this shot, uh, but it's going to be high contrast, but um, I, I, I need to be safe as much as I can while doing this. Uh, it's interesting moving a six foot park trying to keep, you know, half a millimeter, you know, leave it within a half a millimeter. I have no cutter sunk this size, so I'm just going to use the, the rotary deburrer. I have the X-axis mounted, and um, this is mounted in the back with um, 12 of 6mm um, uh, bolts with big washers. As you can see, uh, as you saw before, I drilled them excessively large, so there'll be some vertical adjustment, and then a little bit of horizontal. Too. I'm very happy of how strong this is on this, on this plane here. And uh, it's interesting that, um, and my, I hadn't even really thought of this until uh, one of my friends pointed it out, that uh, this piece here will help triangulate these two places. If you think about, uh, you've got like a small triangle, two, you know, four, four triangles here, or two triangle or diagonal lines here. It strengthens it up, but there may remain to be seen how well it works once you get a router bit because it's, it has to do with vibration too, and um, you know, and vibration can kind of build up standing kind of standing waves and stuff in the uh, in the structure. Uh, to, this x-axis, as you saw, the only thing I had to do so far is trim the bottom of it. And I had worked on this z-axis before, uh, increasing its range and. Um, I knew at some point I was going to have to make it um, lighter, and um, so part of the problem is that it has some really heavy duty, uh, you know, uh, there's there's double row um, uh, bearings in this linear way, heavy duty steel blocks, and uh, huge blocks of aluminum, and uh, you know, weight was no object apparently. It's 33.8 pounds, so that's not good, it's even heavier than I thought it was. I've taken the screws out of the uh, ball screw uh, mount and you know, it mounts on this plate. You know, I'm just going to slide this off. Uh, and this is where most of the weight is and these guys and this. So, But I'm still still going to try to make it the best I can. That's, that's all I can do. So I want to drill a half inch hole in the corner here to put a radius. So when I cut this out to be a little radius, I just like doing stuff like that. Uh, it actually, you know, removes uh, stress risers, uh, stress concentrators, as it were. Instead of measuring this, I just took a steel square and I'm um, taking a transfer punch and just kind of kind of put it kitty corner. I'm going to take a little weight out of here. This isn't much, but uh, I've got to take a whole block out of, out of the other one like this anyhow. So I might as well trim this a little more too. I had a problem when I made my last cut with this, uh, this kind of Sawzall compatible thing. And... Uh, the problem is that it tends to want to skip when it starts. It's very hard to start for me. So what I did is I clamped a little block of metal here that makes a little slot that the uh, the blade, blade kind of goes into this little slot as a guide to get it started. And after it gets started, I can take the block out if I want to. And uh... I have the axis. I have the Z-axis or the up and down axis assembled. This is the back of it where it would mount on the machine. This would be the front of it, and this is where I screwed up this damn thing. I would have would have gotten away with this if I hadn't bumped it against the drill uh, press column, uh, which means it was off center when it started. Even if I had this with a hand drill, it would have been okay. Anyway, so um, I don't know. I'm fairly happy with this. Uh, I didn't fuss on it. I'm a little overzealous in my grinding I over here. And, um, excuse the cars, and these are the pieces I cut out, and it's most of the weight in this is from these steel rails, these steel blocks, and the motor, and the bearings. And the aluminum doesn't count for that much, but I'm still able to eliminate 3.6 pounds from it so far. However, this thing is unnecessarily long, and, um, this the this has got like 200 millimeters of travel. I don't need quite this much, so I decided to uh, forego the eight millimeter attaching bolts for this, and instead I put uh, uh, six of uh, six millimeter uh, screws in this. And uh, this is kind of uh, kind of interesting. I want to show you what this looks like underneath here. So I unbolted the ball screw and the uh, linear bearings, and then this slides like this. 
and it looks like they machine this out of one piece of metal and uh, so it's it's uh, looks like it's it's uh, fly cut or shell milled here and uh, it's bored here they even put a chamfer here they milled it on the edge tapped everything out the thing that's strange and you may not be able to see is the surface finish here because there's a uh, there's machining marks going this way. It almost looks like it's wire EDM cut, but uh, I don't, I don't, unless it was a very, a very nice mill or something, but it just seems like there's machining marks going this way, which is really strange. And uh, anyway, so I guess uh, when you're building wafer fabrication equipment, uh, you can do stuff like this. And um, yeah. This isn't relieved actually here, it's just flat and uh, sometimes they relieve it on both sides like this so there's no chance that the center will rock. And, uh, Sorry about my surface, is getting pretty oily. I changed this just for at the beginning of this project. Anyway, I drilled these holes um, to hold this plate which holds the z-axis on a little large and because I need some wiggle room so I can tilt this this way and this way. And uh, so I drilled the... Uh, the, see the heads have to be counter counterboard like that. In order to do that, um, they usually have um, they have a special cap screw drill bits um, that are made for bottoming these things and countersink. I don't have one of those, so I use the drill a uh, half inch drill bit or an appropriate size drill bit. And then oddly, I took I took a half inch milling bit, and this time I did it with a with a, um, a hand drill because I could control it and I put it in slowest speed and the, the hard you should not try this because you can break the bit so easily this is very hard to control I've used a lot of tools in my life and this is this is persnickety you know I I, I uh, you know I uh, to dress the bottom I know I took some off the side so this is suboptimal buy uh, one of those uh, cap screw things but I only have uh, these six to do so oddly enough I seem to come out okay, and I, I think I'm going to have enough of adjustment there. I just want you to know there's no way I'm going to be able to color correct this because uh, the, uh, the evening light and the um, shop lights are never going to reconcile um, unless I mask it. Anyway, I put a parallel piece of aluminum here, roughly parallel, and I'm using that for a guide to set this up. <laughs> That's so cute. It was getting kind of late when I was mounting this up, but it was hard to stop last night. You could see um, i got to shore up this cart a little bit. Um, um, so I have the Z-axis mounted, and it's... Um, um, fortunately, the X-axis moves really nice. This is a cut ball screw. And if you look at this, I tried. To, I had redesigned this thing in XEVs to put this on the inside and make this backwards. To put most of the weight between the two bearings, you know, these two, uh, these two uh, linear weight bearings, you know, for, as far as the, Z -ax the um, Y axis is. So this is the Z axis or the vertical axis, and this is what I came up with the limit. Switch this for the X axis. So um, some of the machinery I took apart had these cute little uh, metal plates. These are stainless, and with a, a, a micro switch with a little roller attached. So they work like this. And um, I've seen this technique in the, these machines where, where if they're working with aluminum, they will put a little piece of stainless steel or a little piece of steel uh, so the roller has something to, to roll against that won't wear and won't gall uh, because uh, the corner of the roll could probably wear into the aluminum a little bit. So I mounted, um, I tapped out two places for this little piece of stainless steel. This was part of a bracket and uh, mounted that on here. And then I mounted the limit switch uh, like this. And to make this stop, I threaded, I threaded this out for a number six uh, bolt. And this is a standard bolt, and it's pretty smooth here. And uh, I have a washer here. And then this side, this you, it's not entirely easy to see, but you have like a, a six millimeter uh, grub screw. And this is rounded on this side. And I've got a jam nut and a washer, which you can't see. So... You have to put some kind of stop in order for the, to protect the limit switches. And um, this had stops on it, and they weren't adjustable. And I need, I want this limit switch to contact first. And maybe we can hear this. There's this limit switch just contacted, and here's the um, here's the stop. So the stop is pretty robust. 
you can hear the click and the stop. And uh, you can see, unfortunately, I have an extra hole here because uh, I ran because I hadn't drawn out a lot of bolts on this machine, just studs where the bolts will go through. And I was too close to. It. I feel bad. This is I drilled. This is the third extra hole I drilled in this whole machine so far. So I feel bad about this, but uh, it's just my ego. And uh, hypothetically, I just made this a little lighter. Anyway. So in order to mark this position, because these, a lot of, I've done a lot of hand work on this. And that's the hard part about making stuff by hand. If, unless you spend, spend an enormous amount of time on it, you're going to have little fitting issues. And uh, so in other words, um, you know, I wasn't too worried about how long this was or this was. As long as, um, you know, they were fairly close. I needed to mark this location. And what I did is I took out this bolt. And I put in this little uh, this little pin here, and so this has a point on it with two jam with two nuts in the jam nut configuration, and if you tighten one nut against the other, it's it holds really well. And I replaced it with this, and then I just move this over here like this. You now I moved the axis, and then the little point made a little mark right where it needed to be. Then I drilled it and tapped that out, and so. Um, I think this is going to be fine. I still have to strengthen up this cart, but this will protect the switches. The other day, I had one of these motors hooked up to the X-axis, and um, these are strong little motors. They're five phase, and they're, these are strong, and um, um, I was not able to antagonize this. I tried, you know, I tried holding it, and I couldn't get it to skip a beat, so... I think that this motor, this little five-phase motor, and this is probably about 20 years old, but this five-phase motor is well strong enough for this uh, x-axis. And I'm hoping that one of these little guys, oddly enough, is strong for the um, for the big axis. And um, what I'm hoping is that if I turn, you know, if I turn the speeds down enough, then I can I can use one of these motors. These motors are convenient because they've got a little driver of a built-in power supply. So basically, that's this is wonderful convenience. So you basically you plug it into here, you plug power, and you plug your signal, and you don't need an external power, another power supply. So this is cool packaging just to put the power supply f in, in, with each motor. And uh, once again, these are like over 20 years old. And in with the key, keep the idea of making a recycled kind of repurposed machine. So I mounted the um, the, the X motor, and uh, this was a bracket I had kicking around. And um, you see this little gap here. Um, this is kind of interesting. I so I drew out this mount when I was drawing out th this mount, and what I didn't notice when I was looking at it was that this is slightly unsymmetrical, and so I have this little gap here. It's one of those little things that, you know, I just didn't notice, you know, and I like, I'm just trying to get all the metal work done and, um, and I guess I just didn't notice it. This is a little coupler from eBay. It's just like aluminum. It's, I don't even think it's anodized. Um, and it has little polyurethane bushings, a single set screw. So I don't know how I feel about that. I would rather this be steel than aluminum myself, but, uh, these were cheap. I think they were like $7 and 50 cents each. I got two of them at the same time. As you can see, I mounted the cable chain directly onto the aluminum plate on the side here using two 6mm fasteners. Under here, you can see the Y-axis motor, and um, I was surprised to see that this motor, and I was happy to, to see that this motor can move this axis. And I've got another one of these little cheap Chinese $7.50 couplers. And um, this is just a, a 10 millimeter aluminum pl uh, plate that I cut out. And this plate was cut in such a way that it kind of straddles this uh, ball screw mount so it can be adjusted a little bit for alignment and stuff like that. Fortunately, this didn't even need to be shimmed, so, so I'm happy about that. 